Hello everybody and welcome to our uh, fourth video in module 11. This is going to be the last one that we look at uh, on a single population variance. Then we'll get into tests on two population variances. So once again, this is a single population two-tailed test. We'll go through the problem as always to make sure that we can identify exactly what kind of test this is because normally we would not be given that detailed of information. So again, I'm recycling my problems. This is an extension from problem 91B, where we had already done the test on the population mean. Now we're gonna look at the variance. So here, this one might sound familiar. An instructor at the TRU School of Business and, uh, Business and Economics has produced a series of problems and accompanying video walkthroughs in hopes of improving his statistics students' understanding of course content. Having taught the course so many times, he determines the historical average is 76, the population standard deviation is 17.3. I'm just going to highlight things that may be important here for us. At the end of this semester, we have a class of 45 students who had access to the walkthroughs and an average grade of 81.3, standard deviation of 13.6. Using a level of significance of 0.05, test to determine whether those with access to the videos have the same variance as the historical population. There's our test right there. We are testing to see whether or not those students who are using the workbooks, who are using the accompanying walkthrough videos, just as maybe you're doing right now, those students, do they have the same variance in grades as opposed to those who don't have access to that resource? So that's how I know what kind of test we're going to be doing. I'll set up my null and alternative. I know that I'm doing a test on variance because it says I'm testing variance. So I'm gonna set this up, sigma squared, and I have a hypothesized value here. The historical value is found to be 17.3. Now again, I'm writing this as a variance, so I'm gonna make sure that I state this hypothesized value also as a variance. I need to make sure that I'm consistent in how I write things. If you wanted to write this, as a standard deviation, well, you could, and then your hypothesized value would be 17.3. Perfectly acceptable. No, no reason necessarily to do one or the other. It's, it's kind of personal choice. I like to keep things in variance, but either way is perfectly correct. So here I've got my test my hypothesized value what kind of test are we doing well i'm just testing to see whether or not oops whether or not they're the same yes or no so my null yes they're the same my alternative no they're not the same and so that's relatively straightforward as a two-tail test i'm not testing to see if the variance is less than more than at least equal to you know any of those keywords that that lead me to a one tail test i'm simply testing are they the same or not we're doing this test at the 05 level of significance as stated over here okay so we've got our test formulated i formulated my test like this so that if the evidence supports the null hypotheses then I can support the claim that the variance of those students who have access to uh, this resource, the workbooks and the videos, that the variance in their grades is no different from students who don't have that resource. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now I have evidence to show that yes, those students who have access to the workbooks and to the accompanying videos, they do have a different variance in the distribution of their grades. Good, that's it for part A, B. Now we're calculating our test statistics. So again, we need to make sure, as we go through all of these modules, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on, we're gonna have a lot more different types of tests that we do. 
And each of these tests is, of course, a different problem, and each problem requires a different tool to solve that problem. So at this point, we've done certainly fewer types of problems than we will have done when we get to those later modules. We're developing all these tools. We're learning these different tools. Part of the challenge is knowing which tool to grab, which tool to use. And as we go through the, the material, there's more and more tools. It can become a little more difficult to know which one to grab because there's more to choose from. Here I'm doing a test on a single population variance. The tool that I need is that chi-square distribution. So that's the tool that I reach for. And of course, my distribution tables to go along with that. So for our test statistic, my sample size, here's that sample size was 45, 45 minus one. My sample standard deviation, 13.6 divided by my hypothesized value. Now I could put in 17.3 squared, or I can put in my value that I've already squared, 2 point, or 299.29. Now I can calculate my test statistic divided by 299.29, I have a test statistic of 27.19. You don't even need me for the rest of this problem now, right? Because we've gone through so many in the earlier problems, and it's so similar to, well, all of the problems that we've done. Next step, we go to our distribution tables. Here I have 45 minus one, I have 44 degrees of freedom. Our tables aren't that precise anyways. So when I come down here and I'm looking for my variant, uh, my relevant variant for this problem, well, I don't have 44. Closest I have is 45. And so that's the one that I'm going to use. My test statistic was 2719. So I look through that row and I find here, let's change that color, 2719 is between these two values. I follow those up because I need to know those relevant probabilities. And I have 0.99 and 0.975. Well, that's a little bit tedious. So that means my p-value is between 0.99 and 0.975. We have to think very closely about what kind of problem are we doing? Or what kind of information do we have? Given our chi-square distribution table. So remember, what we're doing here, I have a distribution that looks something like this. I have a test statistic of 27 point something, 2719. And I'm getting these big probabilities. Well, remember, these are upper tail probabilities, which means that they must be corresponding to a test statistic that is somewhere down here in that lower tail. So let me just take our values from our distribution. So I have 28, I'm gonna round it just for simplicity, I have 26 and 28. So I have 26, let's say 26 is here, and I have 28 here. So that value 28, that corresponds to an area here of 0.975, and that value of 26 well, that's this whole region here is an area of 0.99. Is that what we want? No, because remember, this is a two-tail test. And so we're, we're thinking, well, in order to get my p-value, I need to find the relevant probabilities that correspond with my test statistic, and I need to multiply those by two to get my p-value. Well, if I look at these two values that I have and I multiply them by two, 
it's going to be way greater than 1. And I can never have a p-value that's greater than 1. Remember when you were doing tests with the t or the z distribution? If I had a, te a, a test statistic that looked something like this, if this was my t, my test statistic here, and if this was a 2 cal test, which probability would I multiply by 2? Would I take this probability here and multiply that by 2? Or would I take this probability out here and multiply that by 2? We always, for the two-tail test, we take the smaller one. Whichever tail our test statistic is in, we need that tail, that smaller probability, and that's the one that we multiply by 2. So when we were doing those tests with the t distribution, that's the probability that we would use, that's the one that we would multiply by 2. So what we have from our chi-square distribution, we've got the wrong probabilities. What I need, if my test statistic is down here, around 27, what I need is that lower tail probability. I need this value here, and I need to multiply that by 2. Well, in order to get those lower tail probabilities from the table that we have, well, I need to calculate 1 minus those upper tail values. And so 1 minus 0.975, that gives me 0.025. So now, let's see if I can clean this up a little bit. Now I have this region here is 0 0.01, and I have this region here is 0 0.025. Now I've got the proper lower tail probabilities. Now those are the ones that for my two tail test, those are the ones I'm going to multiply by 2. So I need to multiply this one by 2, multiply that one by 2. My p-value is between 0 0.02 and 0 0.05. So that one's a little bit tedious. You can see how the process is the same, right? Everything we've done here is, is really the same approach as what we've done for all of the other tests. There's a little extra complication here simply due to the nature of the tables that we're working with. So let me make sure I scribble that out because that's wrong. Our p-value for this exercise is between 0.02 and 0.05. So I can come back up here. I'll rewrite this just so that I have everything in the same spot. 0.05 and 0.02. Our level of significance, of course, our comfort towards committing a type 1 error is 5%. I can see here that our p-value is less than 0.05, which means that if I do choose to reject, my risk of committing a type 1 error is less than what I'm comfortable with. I'll take that chance. I'm comfortable with up to a 5% chance. My exposure here is less than that. So I do have sufficient evidence to reject. Let's go ahead and use the critical value approach as well. So now we start with that level of significance, 0.05. And again, what we want, remember, we're doing a two-tailed test. So my critical value, well, I have two critical values because I'm going to reject if it's large and or if it's too small. So my critical value, I'm going to have two. I'm going to have an upper tail critical value and I'm going to have a lower tail critical value. Now, we already have this one, 1 minus alpha divided by 2, right? That's the one that we just found 
right here. Right? When we divided, uh, when we were looking for our p-value, we found our p-value lied between these two numbers. Right? And this one here is that 1 minus alpha divided by 2. So we already have our lower tail critical value, which was about 28, I might as well be precise here, 28.37. So that lower tail was 20, oops, what's happening here? 28.37. The upper tail critical value, which for the purpose of this problem is really not relevant, considering our test statistic was on the lower side, but just for completeness, here's that alpha by two, and I can come down here, and I can see there's that upper tail critical value is 65.4. So again, that is defining our rejection space. When I look at my chi-squared distribution, let me clean this up a little bit, so similar to what we have done for a two-tailed test, we will reject if our test statistic is less than the lower tail value we will reject if our test statistic is greater than the upper tail value. I think it was 65, yeah, just making sure. And then we do not reject if our test statistic is in between. For us, our test statistic was down here, 27 point something. That falls into that rejection space. So we see, again, both with our p-value approach and our critical value approach, we get the exact same conclusion. Both of them lead us to reject, which means our evidence supports the alternative. Our interpretation, therefore, is that we have sufficient evidence to show that the variance of grades for those students who have access to the workbooks and the corresponding uh, and the accompanying video walkthroughs is different than the variance of those students who do not have access to that resource. Good. So we've got through all of the aspects of the test, p-value approach, critical value approach. And this problem also is asking us to develop a 95% confidence interval. I'm actually going to record a separate video for that one because this one I can see is already getting a little bit long and I'm going to give a little bit of a talk about confidence intervals first and then we'll go through and address that question. So that's it for this video. Come back and we'll produce another shorter one for the interval problem. Okay, thank you for watching everybody. Bye-bye.